If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Colossians chapter 2, and we'll, uh, time is going on, so we'll try and to, you know, keep it brief as we can here on uh, looking at God's Word. We're continuing a little series that we're looking at the book of Colossians. So chapter 2, verse 1, this is what it says, For I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you and for those that let us see you, and for all who have not seen me face to face. We know that Paul the Apostle wasn't the one who established or set up this church. It was Epaphras. He was the one who taught there. He was the one who spoke the gospel. And so that's why he's saying, And for all those who have not seen me face to face, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, to reach all the riches of full assurance, of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I say this in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments, for though I am absent in body, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the firmness of your faith in Christ. And he goes on to talk about being alive in Christ. And this is what he says, Therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. And then this is what he says directly after that, For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. And you have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, (coughs) by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. And you who were dead in trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by cancelling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to an open shame by triumphing over them in him. So that's us this morning. We're looking again at the book of Colossians. And this little book is a fascinating little letter written by Paul the Apostle. And even in so little small a book or in just four chapters, there's an awful lot of depth to it. There's an experience of Paul that comes through. And you know that whenever you read the letter that here is a man, Paul the Apostle, who is first of all sold out for the Lord Jesus Christ. Here is a man who loves the Lord Jesus. Here is a man who is passionate about Jesus. And he had a good reason to be passionate and to love the Lord Jesus because he was a man who first of all knew that he was forgiven. All of his sins, all of the things that he had done wrong was forgiven and forgotten by God. And that is the greatest thing that can ever happen to you or to me in this lifetime. I know that in life there is a lot of good things that will happen to us. I know that yes, there's a lot of great things and we feel encouraged by them and we feel inspired by them. There is a lot of good things that will happen in life and also a lot of bad things. But the best thing to know is that our sins have been forgiven. To know that our conscience is cleansed. And I sometimes will say that around this city, whenever you're imagining praying for the city of Lisbon, that there are many people who still carry around them that scar or that sense of guilt that sin has left. You see, there are many people about the city today who will have fast cars and there's nothing wrong with that. There are many people in the city of Lisbon and they will have big houses and there is nothing wrong with big houses. There are many people who will have healthy bank accounts and again, there is nothing wrong with having a healthy bank account. But there are a lot of people in our city here this morning who have never yet experienced the forgiveness of sins and the peace that it brings and the debt that is cancelled out because of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. To have that weight lifted from us, to know that God has spoken directly into our soul and into our heart and he has said, I forgive you. I forgive you. And a little later down the chapter, we will touch upon that and exactly what Jesus did for you and for me. But Paul begins chapter 2 with these words, and this is what he says, For I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you and for those that let us see you, and for all who have not seen me face to face, that their hearts may be encouraged. Here was a church, and Paul says that their hearts may be encouraged. You see, you can have all of the head knowledge that you want about the Lord Jesus Christ today. You can learn a lot with your minds. But it's whenever we come to Jesus with our hearts that we truly experience Him. 
It's whenever we come with our hearts this morning that we truly live out what he wanted us to be. It's with the heart that we encounter him. It's with the heart that he comes and takes control of our lives. You see, if Jesus has our heart, then he has all of you and me. If Jesus has our heart this morning, then he has our love, he has our affection, he has us. And from time to time, we need to encourage our hearts. We all need a little encouragement. Irrespective of who we are or what position we hold in the church, we need to take time out at some point and encourage our own hearts. You might sit there and you might think, well, he or she is doing well spiritually speaking. They, they don't need encouraged as much as I do, but you could be wrong this morning. Someone next to you could be right on the canvas and struggling and you could make, them a, dif- could make a difference in their heart by just going over and taking an interest and in encouraging their heart. So whenever you encourage someone's heart this morning, you're speaking right into their life at the right moment, at the right time. You're speaking into the core of who that person is. You're encouraging them to be a better person for the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, what happens so often around the church today and whenever we look at it is we see so many discouraged people, don't we? Doesn't, whether in the workplace or whether it's here in the church, we, we encounter so many people and it's almost as if the life has just been sucked right out from them. It's almost as if it's evaporated, as if it's gone from them, as if there's just a sense of just discouragement. They can't see, they can't lift their head, they can't do anything and, and nothing is, is going or clicking into gear for them. And, they're, and we see too, too many people today that are discouraged. And what we need to do is we need to encourage them. We need to encourage their heart. And what happens is whenever you put someone down time and time again, eventually that person is going to believe it. Eventually they're going to start putting themselves down without anybody else needing to put them down. And that's what happens. If someone is put down constantly time and time again by another person or another organization and they're made to feel small time and time again, then they start to believe that they are just small or they are insignificant. And what we need to do is encourage them and build them up. That's not who you are in the Lord Jesus. You see, Jesus came to build you up. He came to lift you up. He came to raise you up so that you could be seated with him and in him in the heavenly places. I wonder could I leave you with a little challenge this morning of maybe just taking time out and seeing someone and going over to them and just encouraging them. You know, it could be something small. It could be Just asking them, how are you? Can I pray for you? Is there anything that I can pray for you in your life? Can I share with you a little scripture verse that that I read this morning in my own devotion and just go over and encourage them in the Lord? And that's what Paul is doing here. He's encouraging the church. And notice what he does whenever he encourages them. He points them to Jesus. That's how Paul the apostle encouraged someone. And that's the best way to encourage someone here today. If you want to be encouraged, then look to the Lord Jesus. You see, if I was to look around at the super Christians today, if I was to look around at people today, I would get depressed. I would be discouraged. If I were to focus my attention on the world and the things of the world, then I would get down. But we're not told to do that. We're not told to do that. In the scriptures, we're told to look onto Jesus. And that's what we do. We look on to Jesus, the offer and finisher of our faith. I've shared with you before how whenever you're running a marathon, you, you get encouraged by those who are up ahead for, through those who have finished the race. You see them and you can see the finish line in sight and you think, well, I'm nearly there. I can make it. And you keep looking for that, knowing that it's going to come sooner or later. And that's what we do. We look on to Jesus. And with our eyes upon the Lord Jesus, then we will get through it. We will get there. Paul goes on to say in verse 2, and this is what he says, being knit together in love, to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So here is the church of Colossae, and we're told that they were knit together. And 
you, just, you probably all know my knitting skills aren't very good. Um, you can, you know, I don't go home and, and sit with two knitting needles out and try and join all the little stitches and all together, but there's probably some out there. And I'm going to come across as a real novice when talking about knitting here, but I'm, I'm going to do my best and you're going to, you know, hopefully put it together. But whenever you knit something, it binds together. It, each knot or each thread has a, has a role to play. And that's what the church is. The church is knit together. And knitting is a process where a piece of thread or a piece of wool can be made into something attractive. And that's what it is. It's a process. Each row, each stitch takes time. And if the stitches aren't secured, then what happens is you just get it all unraveling in a big ball, don't you? If the, if the stitches aren't put on properly, if they're not connected in any way, you just end up with a ball of wool just lying at your feet, which is useless to no one. And you and I together today, the church, we are knit together. And how are we knit together? How are we secured? By love. It binds us together. It holds us together. If we don't have that love, then we will unravel and fall apart. And Paul says, and he uses that word, being. Being knitted together. Being knitted together. In other words, it's continuous. It's present it not wo- it's not was knitted together. It's not will one day be knitted together. It is not an aspirational idea that Paul is presenting to the church of Colossae. He's telling them this is how the church should be. This is how you should be. It doesn't matter what's going on, being knitted together in love. For what purpose? To reach all the riches of full assurance and understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery. We all need assurance. We all need assurance. And I know that you probably sometimes maybe, you know, from year to year, you know, look up for new car insurance or you're looking up for new home insurance, whatever the case may be. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about an assurance today of the soul. We all need a little more understanding. We all need more knowledge. But of what? God's mystery. And what is that mystery? Paul says that mystery is Christ Jesus. You see, the world will never understand Jesus. The world will never know Jesus. Your unsaved friends will never not get Jesus or your unsaved family members. Why? Because they're trying to understand him with their head. They're trying to know him with the mind. And whenever you need to see him, you need to see him with the heart. And Paul is saying that all understanding is found in Jesus. And that's how great he is. Paul is saying that we need to know the Lord Jesus Christ, that he is the be all and the end all of everything. And to know Jesus, you first of all have to have a relationship with him. He needs to abide in you and you need to be able to abide in him. It takes faith. We've all had people or some people are as Christians and particularly as a pastor as well, you get confronted with some people who want to ask question after question after question. And they almost feel that if they could have all of these answers, you know, answered before they get saved, then they would get saved, if you understand what I mean. You know, if they had another question, another, and they could fire all these questions at you so they could. And, you know, all it is, is it's almost as if another question is another stumbling block just to get over But that's not, and and we are confronted with that time and time again. We've probably been in positions where people have challenged our faith. They've said many things, they've reasoned with us, they've argued with us. Until the end of it all, we're struggling even to form an answer. And the church of Colossae was in that same position. They had teachers who were trying to deceive or trying to get the church to look at other things. And Paul says, no. Paul says, that no one may delude you with plausible arguments. That's what he says. That's what he uses. Plausible arguments. And these people were on the inside of the church and they were trying to delude even the very Christians. And today we have the same problem. You could go home and you could search and Google for all kinds of theories, for all kinds of arguments. And you could say with Paul, do you know what? They're plausible arguments. But because they're plausible arguments, it doesn't make them right. Because they're plausible arguments doesn't mean that they are scripturally sound or correct. 
Because the person who is in front of you saying all of what they are saying can turn you upside down and even if they could and even as they try to maybe twist scripture against you and you're standing there and you're still going, boy, I don't have an answer to give here. I'm struggling. I'm treading water trying to give an answer or informed opinion on this. It happens from time to time. You have to remember that Paul the Apostle is dealing most likely with a group of people who were called the Gnostics and, and they were people who were in the know. They had a superior knowledge in everyone and everything and everything in their, their form of religion was given in mysteries or in forms of mysteries and Paul counters that by saying, Do you know, the only mystery is Jesus. And by that, what I mean is he is the only one that you need to know. Once you know Jesus, you know all there is to know because in him, Paul says, is hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Jesus is the difference. He makes the difference. So whenever someone is talking to you about these other arguments and you're wondering how can you respond, see the best thing, or sometimes you get them coming to your door, see the best way to respond, give them your testimony because they can't argue with your testimony. They can't understand it. It is your experience Whenever they come and they rap on the door and they've got their literature or whatever they've got with them and they're trying to present argument after argument and they're trying to say, well, it's the same God. It's not the same God. They're trying to say we believe in the same Jesus. No, they don't believe in the same Jesus. They're trying to say that they believe in the same heaven that we believe in. They do not believe in the same heaven that we believe in. Whenever they're standing there and you're struggling to give an answer or an opinion, give them your testimony. Talk to them about the Jesus that you know, the Jesus that you know in the scriptures. And you know what? They'll not be able to reason or argue with you. So Paul here, first of all, he was dealing with knowing the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he moves in and he begins to talk about growing in the Lord Jesus. And we all know how something grows. You feed it, you water it, you give it fertilizer or whatever, and it grows. A plant, for instance, can't survive without water. And I stopped watering the plants. I have a wee balcony. And on that there wee balcony, there are a number of plants. There's petunias and, you know, geraniums and different things. You know, I forget the names of them. But just buy them. look nice in the shop. And you, you put them in, in, in the planters. And for a week, I stopped watering them. And they went awful. You know, they, whenever you stop watering them, they just sort of wilt away. But I watered them yesterday and sort of revived back again. And you, they need water. They need to be fed. And that's how a plant lives. And Tom has a plant in his office and he's listening here on, on the screen and it needs watered so it does. So whenever you're talking to him, you can say, Tom, have you watered the plant in your office? And he'll say that it's okay, but it's not. It needs water. And the same is true of our spiritual life. We need to take time to water our spiritual walk with God, to feed ourselves in God. So whenever we first come to the Lord Jesus Christ, we became spiritually alive. And at that moment, we realize that, you know what, we need to grow in Jesus. And spiritual growth is a process. We become Christians in the instant that we receive the Lord Jesus Christ. And then what happens after that is it takes a whole lifetime for us to grow in our faith, to grow in the Lord, to grow closer to him and our knowledge of the Lord Jesus. So how do we grow? Verse 6 says, Therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. So how did you receive the Lord Jesus? You received the Lord Jesus through faith. It says in the scriptures, by grace you have been saved through faith. We are saved through faith and we continue in our spiritual walk by faith. We walk by faith, not by sight. We walk in him which is the Lord Jesus Christ. The Hebrew writer says that faith is pleasing to God. Our faith pleases God. Our faith makes God respond to us. And that's how we talk to God. That's how we commune with God through faith. And Paul then makes reference most likely to a tree and there are three ways that he deals with us and three ways that our faith can grow and be encouraged in the Lord. And he says, firstly, we need to be rooted. Firstly, we need to be rooted. A tree, you see, will sink its roots into the ground and it will go into the ground looking for water to be able to feed it. 
And you and I are to put our spiritual roots down in God's word so that we too can also be fed. If we're not reading God's word, if we're not attending a church, if we're not allowing ourselves time to hear from God, then he's not going to be able to grow in us. We're not going to spiritually grow. And the image is that Paul the Apostle is referring to here is in Jeremiah chapter 17 and verse 8. And he says, He will be like a tree planted by the waters. It sends out its roots by the stream. It does not fear when heat comes. Its leaves are always green. It has no worries in a year of drought and never fails to bear fruit. And that's what happens whenever you and I are rooted in the Lord Jesus Christ. We have everything that we need. We do. We have everything that we need. If you turn in the scriptures and if you were to look at Matthew's gospel chapter 6 and if you were to look at the very, very end of it, this is what the Lord Jesus says. He says, that is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life, whether you have enough food or drink or enough clothes to wear. It isn't life more than food in your body, more than clothing. Look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns for your heavenly father feeds them. And aren't you more valuable to him than they are? You matter to God. Isn't that amazing? That the God of all of the universe, the God who created everything, the God who spoke the world into being, you and I. And sometimes we feel ourselves to feel insignificant. Sometimes we put ourselves down. But God this morning places a tremendous value upon your life. And why worry about your clothing? Look at the lilies of the field and how they grow. They do not work or make their clothing. Yet Solomon in all his glory was not dressed as beautifully as they are. And if God so wonderfully cares for the wildflowers that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow, he will certainly care for you. Why do you have so little faith? So don't worry about these things saying what we will eat, what we will drink, what we will wear. These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers, but your heavenly Father already knows your needs. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously and he will give you everything that you need. So don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. We have a great God and we place our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and he cares And he looks after us. The next thing is we're to be built up. To be built up in Jesus or in him. The deeper a tree sinks its roots, the taller it will grow. And the deeper that we go with Jesus and the more that we will grow with the Lord. Whenever we think of something being built up, you think of getting the foundations right. You think of getting everything in place that you need to do to build upon something. And if you this morning are building your spiritual life around anything else other than Jesus then you're building on the wrong foundation and you will not grow the Lord Jesus speaks of himself being the true vine in John chapter 15 and he says as long as the branches are connected to him as a true vine then they will receive their spiritual strength but the minute that that vine begins to get its strength and go deep into the ground or elsewhere then it becomes detached from the vine and it is thrown out because it is Good for nothing. The next thing we're told is to be established in Jesus. Sometimes whenever we see a clothing firm, they'll put a logo on it. They'll say established in 1867 or established in 1971 or a football team. It'll say on their crest established and and it'll give the year or the date whenever they were established. And they're very proud of whenever they're established because it says that we have been here for a long time. We're proud of our history. We're proud of who we are. We haven't lost our roots. That's where we were established. That's where we get our identity from. And you and I tonight, we are established in Jesus. And that's where we get our roots. That's where we get our beginning. That's where we get our identity when it's in Jesus. You see, not only will a tree send its roots down deep for water, but the roots will spread out. And whenever the roots begin to spread out, it gives the tree stability, gives the tree strength so that it won't topple over. And if you and I were spiritually speaking to make a a clothing firm or to wear t-shirts with our logo on it, it would be this, established in the faith. Established in the faith. That's where it began. That's where we stay in the faith. And if we lose our faith, we lose our way, we lose who we are in Jesus. And that's what happens. We need to remain established in the faith. 
Then Paul goes on and he says these words, See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. You see, the true believer, those who are truly saved, will be able to know if something is contrary to the Lord Jesus Christ. They will recognize it as, as a, from a, a different spirit, from a different power, from a different authority, because they will know that that is not from the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says, for in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. And that the Lord Jesus Christ is, he, he, God reveals himself through the Lord Jesus Christ in the flesh. But we also know in the scriptures, the Lord himself said, God is a spirit and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And he says, and you have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. In him you are also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. And then he says this. This is the best part. And you were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh. God made alive. Am I speaking to people today and you are alive? Not just physically. I know I can see you there smiling or, you know, dropping off near. I can see you out there. But are you alive and gaunt? How, you know, do you feel, you know, the joy of the Lord that says your strength? Do you believe you have a reason to celebrate? Do you believe you have a reason to worship whenever the guys come up here and lead us in worship? Are you alive in God? And then he says, having forgiven all our trespasses. And that's wonderful. Because it's not just one sin. He doesn't look at our sins and, and measure them in, in the weight of sin or in the size of the sin. He doesn't say, look, I'll forgive you that sin. But see, that sin there, I'll, I'll not forgive you that. That's not what he does. He takes all of our sin and he forgives it all. All. All our sins. Big sins. We sins. Sins we don't want other people to know. But he sees us. He's seen us in our sin. He died and he forgives us. And then he says, by cancelling the record of debt, that stood against us with its legal demands. When a person was sentenced or sentenced to be executed or to die upon a cross in Roman times, with them whenever they were hung upon the cross, nailed to the cross also was the sentence that they were given or the reason why they were dying. If they were a murderer, then on that placard or on that uh, piece of wood that would have been nailed to the cross as well, would have been, they are a murderer, that is why they're dying. If they stole, then it was the reason what they, were, what they had stole would have been written on that placard or whatever, you know, on, on the cross. And that's why whenever the Lord Jesus Christ died, they put a sign above his head saying that he is the king of the Jews and the Jewish people or the leaders came and they said, don't write that he, that he is king of the Jews, but write that he said he is the king of the Jews. And so that kept with that tradition of, that's what they did. That's what the Romans did. That's what the, the soldiers did at the cross. They put on what the person committed or the crime that they did. And Paul uses this as a picture of what Jesus did for you and for me. How Jesus paid all of our debt that we owed and how he lifted it and he took that debt and he nailed it to the cross. Jesus paid all of our debt. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it. White as snow. And your sin, my sin, was nailed to the cross. No matter how many times the enemy may make, us, may make us feel guilty, no matter how many times the enemy will come and remind us of past sins, no matter how many times the enemy would want to bring us down or to make us feel down, then we just have to look to the cross and we just have to remember, do you know what? That's where it was paid. That's where it was dealt with. That was the end of it. That's where you were finished. It is finished. Tetelestes paid in full and off. Our debt was cancelled and he paid it. And then he finishes with these here words in this little portion of scripture. He says, and this is <clears throat> where we fit in with a lot of things that are teaching going on today. It says, he disarmed the rulers and authorities, put them to an open shame by triumphing over them in him. The enemy this morning has been stripped of all of his powers. What power he ever once had, he doesn't have anymore because he was defeated at the cross. He was disar disarmed. 
And then the term that it says triumphing over them reminds us of whenever the Roman army conquered another country or the king and the leaders along with them, were, along with the defeated army, they were paraded through the city, out at front, as if to say, look who we did. Look who we defeated. These are the defeated ones. We are the champions. And what they would have done, you know whenever you get that little saying, there's, a, there's a, the sweet smell of victory in the air, right? The women would have come out and they would have watched the Roman soldiers come in and out front would have been the guys that they defeated and they would have been made a spectacle of. What the women of the town and of the city that, that were celebrating, they would have threw their perfume up in the air, Right? And so whenever they came through and they were marching through, there was that smell of victory in the air. And that's what Paul the Apostle alludes to in in 1 Corinthians as well about that aroma, that fragrance, that smell of victory. And that's what the Roman soldiers did. And that's what Jesus did at the cross of Calvary. He did that with the devil and all of his demons. He put them to an open shame. He made a, a spectacle of them. He defeated them. And I read a little interesting quote on Facebook or Twitter during the week, and, and this is what it said, and this is what I'll leave you with. Someone in the church here put it on, and I can't remember who it is, so whoever you are and you're listening, it's you. Imagine you were arrested for being a Christian. Would they have enough evidence to charge you with? Eh? Imagine you were arrested this morning for being a Christian. Would they have enough evidence to charge you with being a Christian. In other words, does your workmates know who you are? In other words, do your friends, your family know who you are? Are you unashamed? Are you, unashamed? Are you a soldier for the Lord Jesus Christ? Because if you are this morning, they should know. And they should know about the love of God and the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. Bless his name. Amen.